Hello, my name's Joel Dunning. We're here at the STS 2024 with uh, Leonard Girardi. Uh, Leonard, thank you so much for coming to talk to us today. You're Chief of, uh, of Surgery in Wild Cornell in New York. And today uh, you are advocating for, for surgical aortic valve replacement uh, and really reminding us what is the truth uh, about uh, SAVA versus TAVA. And so maybe you could just start by telling us a little bit about what you were telling the audience uh, in that session today. Well, the entire session was really focused on highlighting the efficacy and durability of surgical aortic valve replacement. And, uh, you know, there, there's been so much in the literature and in the lay press regarding percutaneous valve technology and its advantages. And, and definitely for the right patient, it's the right procedure. There's no doubt about that. But I think that the pendulum has swung a little bit too far towards these percutaneous and less evasive therapies, not because it's giving patients a better outcome. There's a lot of other reasons behind that swinging pendulum, and I think that it's, it behooves us to, to really emphasize to patients and to cardiologists that a surgical aortic valve replacement, for the right reasons in the right patient, is an exceedingly safe and durable uh, outcome. And we really think that that's true, and we have the data to back that statement up. And I guess it is mainly in the low risk person that this is perhaps going too far uh, in TAVAS, isn't it? Because I guess on the operative front, it's very low risk, very low mortality, low stroke rate, low pacemaker rate, isn't it? And, uh, and it's these low risk people that may be a little bit younger that will be getting these complications. And really, we should be passing that on, shouldn't we? That it's the, you know, the next five, 10 years, uh, actually, the comorbidities are more with TAVA. Well, I, I... You know, one of the things that's a little bit disappointing, as you, as you saw from the talks today, is that even by two years ago, two years before any data was presented in a low-risk cohort out to four or five years, even before that data was present, the pendulum had already swung to a 50-50 distribution of SAVR and TAVR in large data sets like things you heard of like Vizient. That's alarming. It's not this, I use the word disappointing because it's in a academic forum, but it's actually alarming. And yeah. it, it, that really shouldn't happen when you think about it. There's no data to support it. It hasn't been FDA approved for that indication. And yet 50% of patients less than 65 got a TAVR with a 25% risk of a pacemaker and a durability that's certainly in question in a younger patient population, which we already know from surgical valve replacement that tissue valve durability in younger patients is certainly going to be an issue going forward. Absolutely. And so if you were talking to the surgeons out there today, you know, where should we be making the arguments? I guess it's everything, isn't it? It's pacemakers, it's thrombosis risk, it's durability, uh, and it's the, it's the excellent outcomes of surgical AVR. Where, where would you say are the key areas to highlight to patients and cardiologists? Well, I, I think the, the key thing first and foremost, right, the key to long-term survival, short-term survival. Uh, and so you got to be able to deliver the goods at a very low rate for surgical aortic valve replacement. And as you saw from a recent uh, paper published in the Annals of Thoracic Surgery from the STS database, I think surgeons across the U.S. are doing a great job. In that same low-risk cohort, if you had an STS calculated risk of 1% or so and you were less than, not 65, you were less than 75, your risk was less than a percent, and your five-year survival was in excess of 95 to 96 percent. That's pretty darn good, and it's certainly better than what we've seen in low-risk TAVR trials. And, and would you say also that perhaps the, the redo TAVR story is maybe a little bit undersold? There's, there's a lot of, you can just have another and another, but, but actually that's, it's a very different procedure, isn't it? Certainly time limited the ability to really go through all the data and all the different scenarios where TAVR has become a, a, a very important presence. Um, but I do have some concerns for patients, again, younger patients who have had previous valves put in for whatever reason. They go for a valve in valve TAVR. Uh, maybe that's the right choice, maybe it's not, but I think it's an easy sell, right? For patients who have had a previous sternotomy or whatever they may have had, Sure, the idea of going through another one is not, is not anything anybody wants to contemplate. I don't want it any more than anybody else. But by the same token, I think if you're faced with that decision, you'd much rather be faced with that decision at 60 or 65 than you would at 75 or 80, because then the risks just start to really incrementally go up. 
And do you think there's a, there is an argument that concomitant procedures get missed out in TAVA as well? You know, there's quite a bit of data that, you know, if you take the randomized trials, there's a lot less revask going on in these people that because people look more carefully as surgeons, don't they? Whereas these get ignored when you go and have a TAVA. Would you say that can be an argument as well sometimes? For sure. And I think you saw from two of the presentations in the session, I think the importance of mitral insufficiency is underappreciated, but we're bringing it to the forefront. The importance of atrial fibrillation and the concomitant treatment of atrial fibrillation with respect to stroke, but even survival, as you saw from some of the data presented today, it's becoming more evident that these are things that, okay, you can treat the aortic valve, but you sort of can't forget about the rest of it because it, it will have an impact. And, and the same can be said for coronary disease, aneurysmal disease, I mean, the list goes on and on. So it just requires a focus of attention to really take a look at these subsets of patients in a very meaningful way and try to make sense of what the right thing to do is for each patient. And so, so where would you say the future should be? You know, what, what, what are your recommendations to, to a, us, a group of guided surgeons, and also the wider community, and maybe patients? You know, what, what, what's the next five years going to bring, and how can we ensure balance? Well, I don't know how we can ensure balance, but I think that we have to continue to follow the results of these trials very carefully and be very transparent in data interpretation. You know, if, if any of the engineers are even remotely close to accurate in their calculations, we're gonna start seeing some of these TAVR valves, perhaps their durability is gonna start waning in around that seven to eight year mark. And we're not there yet. And if a lot of them start to fail at that time period, it's gonna be eye-opening. Now, whether that happens or not, right, it don't, time will tell. And, and if it doesn't happen, then kudos to the tower crowd. And we'll, we'll figure out you know, how to deal with that. But I think right now, continue to do what we're doing, improve the product that we put out there, um, be aggressive at data interpretation and understand it not only for yourself, but being able to explain that to your patients in a way that's meaningful to them, uh, crucial. Yeah. And, and do you think the tide should turn a little on mechanical valves? I mean, people are still quite down on, on a mechanical valve that lasts forever your whole life and just take Coumadin, which can be monitored at home. Do you think, do you think the, the tide should turn a little bit towards that, onyx valves and things that have lower anticoagulation? Or what's your personal feeling on, on when you offer a mechanical versus a biological valve surgically? Well, you have to remember, first and foremost, it's a patient-level decision. Um, we're there to provide information and I, I think we have to be careful how we bias patients to make that decision because it impacts their life as far as getting their INRs checked, watching what they eat, watching what they drink, you know, do you cut yourself shaving? I mean, these are things that we tend to belittle, but for the average person that has to go through this day to day, for some, that level of inconvenience is more meaningful than others. There's no question that mechanical valves are underappreciated. I, I agree with that statement that we can be a lot more aggressive at placing mechanical valves, particularly modern mechanical valves, perhaps ones that require less anticoagulation. We should be more aggressive in at least offering them to the patients. But being very open and transparent about pluses and minuses and then of course you know ultimately it's the patient's decision as long as they understand what you're putting in front of them that's their decision and you're you work for them don't forget that yeah yeah and I, I guess that's what I, we, everyone's got to to remember isn't it yeah so both sides you know we've got to balance in a balanced way put those risks together and we've got to talk about long-term risks not just the the risk of the day that it gets put Very in isn't so. that right Very much so. Yeah, so thank you so much for coming to talk to us about thank that. You. And you're super busy here, rushing around everywhere. And it was really, it was a packed uh, house for your talk. So congratulations on that. And well, it was a so great much. session. And the organizers of the STS program committee did a fantastic job of coming up with a cogent topic that's obviously affecting everybody in this building today. So we're you know, happy to be part of it. Great. Thank you so much. Thank that's you. Great. Pleasure.